We've come to the fourth and final part of the four-part series where we introduce you to HEC's Watershed Analysis Tool, or HEC Watt. My name is Chris Dunn, and I'm the director of HEC. Specifically, in this presentation, we're going to show you some field implementations of HEC Watt and introduce you to some of the challenges and solutions in performing such studies. Um, the objectives that we've talked about in the past were need for systems and watershed approaches with risk analysis. We introduced you to the Watt. We introduced you to the flood risk analysis compute option within the Watt. We talked about the consequence and performance metrics and how they're similar to what FDA produces as well as what ER 1105-2-101 requires. In this particular presentation, we're going to introduce you to some field implementations, show you how the Watt was used, and talk about the challenges and solutions of running a tool like HEC Watt with the flood risk analysis compute option. So the first example that we're going to look at was um, on the Mississippi River and um, through St. Paul, Minnesota. The purpose of this particular study was uh, to perform a pilot study of the flood risk analysis compute option. And we did this for the levy safety group of the core. They were interested in knowing how the WAP would work. So it's a simple study, small study, one county, two consequence areas, approximately 3,800 structures, one levy, one fragility curve location, only RAS, HC RAS, and HC FIA were utilized in this particular study. The Red River of the North Climate Change Study, the Watt was used here to facilitate the running of many, many, many um, res sim uh, simulations. And the Watt watershed was configured to handle the simulation of 10 weather generations from one climate projection per period. So, a completely different study. The first study was just a pilot study uh, where we ran FIA and RAS. In this particular study, we only ran res sim. So it's important to know that if you want to use the watt, you do not have to have models for hydrology, hydraulics, reservoirs, and consequences. You may only need, in like in this case, uh, a reservoir model. Kaskaski River Watershed Study. Here, what we wanted to do is convert SWIMS models into watt models and run them for a planning-esque type study. So the Kaskaskia watershed um, was about 5,800 square miles. Um, there's 210 miles of hydraulics modeling performed. Seven tributaries were included, three reservoirs. And in this case, HMS, ResSim, RAS, and FIA were all utilized on the Kaskaskia River swims to watt conversion study. The Russian River watershed was also a swims to watt conversion, but in this case, we really did that because we wanted to use it for a FIRO or forecasted informed reservoir operation type study. And the Russian River uh, watershed out in California is about 1,500 square miles, and we did the study alongside of Sonoma County Water Agency. 110 miles of hydraulic models were included with seven tributaries, about 36,000 structures were included two reservoirs, and again, HMS, ResSim, RAS, and FIA models were included. The Bluestone Dam Safety Study was another implementation of HEC Watt. In particular, we wanted to look at reevaluating the probable maximum flood and the likely overtopping uh, with uncertainty on hydrology and reservoir conditions. In this case, only the hydrologic sampler and HEC ResSim were utilized in this implementation of the Watt. Willamette Watershed was also a dam safety study. Uh, 11,500 11, square miles basin, 187 miles of hydraulics, 11 major tributaries, 13 reservoirs included in this particular study. And again, HMS, ResSim, RAS, and FIA models were used or implemented in the watershed. And then granddaddy of them all, the Columbia River Watershed. Huge study. Uh, 258,000 square miles, two countries, United States and Canada, seven states, 1,200 miles of hydraulics, 125 tributaries, 176,000 structures, including 51 reservoir projects, 100 fragility curve locations, 43 consequence areas, and 128 levee systems, incorporating 449 miles of levees. So this was the granddaddy of them all of the um, Watt type of studies. In this particular study, the purpose is to support the Columbia River Treaty study 
which is a joint study between the Canadians and the U.S. to see whether we want to continue with the treaty as is, or do we want to modify the treaty, or do we want to stop the treaty um, entirely? So that's the purpose of this particular WAP model is to help them uh, perform that study. So some new challenges. So along with any new software, especially ones as comprehensive as HEC Watt, you will have challenges. And so some of our challenges include uncertainty analysis and trade-offs between detailed modeling and important sources of uncertainty. Are we going to evaluate each and every parameter or are we only going to evaluate the uncertainty about the parameters that make a difference? How do we reduce the computational burden? You know running RAS and ResSim and FIA and HMS over a large study area thousands, thousands of times is going to have a computational burden. We'll talk about some of that. How do we model multiple failure modes? Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, not so much here, um, but it's something that we want to do in the future. How do we maintain technology? So, for example, every time we get a new version of RAS or ResSim or HMS, does everything have to change? Does the watt have to change? And the answer is no. With the plug-in capability, we do not have to make those kinds of changes. Lifecycle modeling, we talked about that. Uh, we do need lifecycle modeling in the watt eventually to include rehab, repair, and flood recovery, but it's not there yet. Consequence evaluation, economic, social, environmental, life loss. How do we make decisions across all those different um, values? Um, very difficult. And then risk communication, trade-off analysis will likely encourage stakeholder support. So it's a challenge. How do we get the uh, stakeholders involved? So some of the ways we're trying to address some of these challenges are implementing tools like or innovative approaches like the time window modifier. So in a nutshell, what it does is it allows you to run RAS for a two-week period while you're running ResSim for a whole year. So you take the Columbia River Tree, for example. Because the hydropower requirements were a part of the Columbia River Treaty, we had to run ResSim for the entire year. But you really only had to run RAS for periods of uh, peak discharges when flooding might occur. So that might be a couple of weeks or a month or two. So you can gain a lot of efficiencies and reduce the computational burden by only running uh, RAS for maybe a two-week time period while you're running res sim for an, a whole annual time period. So it makes a big difference in allowing you to modify your time window per product or per piece of software. Huge change in the length of time it takes to run the model. Model skip rules editor, another way we're trying to address these challenges. And this capability, what you're basically saying is that if a certain threshold is not exceeded, then you don't have to run that model. So for example, um, if you were to take the two-year event on any river system, most people would say that's bank to bank full. So if you were to look at that two-year event on a flow frequency curve, how, what percentage of events is two years or below? It's about 50%. So if you say that flooding is really not going to occur until it gets outside of the uh, banked area, then you can eliminate all the events that are two years or less. And so that's 50% of the events. So that's 50% of the runs or 50% of the years you don't have to run, say, RAS. So again, saving you considerable time in your uh, calculations. So a great way to reduce your computational burden. Distributed computing is another thing that we're working on. Originally, when we first started the Watt, we could run it on one piece of uh, one computer and 100 life cycles or 5,000 events would take us about 87 days to run on one computer. Then we tried using them on our local network and we could go from 87 days down to about 10 days using 10 computers. If you moved it to the cloud, then we're running 50,000 events, not 5,000 events, but 50,000 events across 10 computers, and we could do that in about 10 days. And now it's significantly less than that. So just to kind of give you an idea of the modeling improvements, 
in, in 2013, when we first were running the Columbia River Treaty events, it was taking us about 90 minutes per event to run. Um, at the end of the Columbia River Treaty study, it was taking us about 25 minutes per event to run. So a significant decrease. Uh, this is an average of about 50 events per life cycle and includes some modeling uh, models being skipped. Um, so again, we have made and continue to make great strides in improving the efficiency of running the lot and reducing the amount of time it takes to run the lot. So not, not only is it the performance of the lot, but it's also the amount of data that the lot can save. So in the Columbia River Treaty, you can save an astronomical amount of data. So for example, you have the option to save all output. And if you do that on the Columbia River Treaty, um, it was taking up approximately 32.5 terabytes of information for 50,000 events. But there's an option within the lot that you don't have to save all that data. You can delete model files and save only the time series and scalar information. And you, if you do that, you'll go from 32.5 terabytes down to about 1.5 terabytes. Still, a lot of data, but um, significantly less than saving all the data. And then, if you just want to save the scalar information itself, you're only looking at about 50 megabytes. So you go from 32.5 terabytes of information down to 50 megabytes of information, of scalar information. So this particular presentation in total is about 36 megabytes. So really, you can get all the Columbia River Treaty data down to about 50 megabytes or about the size of this particular um, PowerPoint presentation. A lot of flexibility there. So at HEC, we've developed um, a distributed computing tool called Nebula, where you can do distributed compute to reduce your overall run times by managing jobs across multiple virtual machines and utilizing the processors within. It's a great way to run the FRA compute of the watt and not eat up your computational space, but use our computational space to do that for you. We can help you get that set up if you're interested. So in the conclusion, uh, HEC Watt FRA is a planning and evaluation tool that conducts risk assessments in a systems context. So important, systems context. It includes systems approaches, event sampling, alternative analysis, structural and non-structural analysis. Does not do costs yet. Remember, we talked about that, but it will. Uh, does life loss computations, can compute agricultural damage as well as structural damage. It is being used nationwide for dam levy safety evaluations and assessments and planning and design studies. If you're interested in using the tool HEC Watt, please contact me or any number of people at HEC and we can get you started on a Watt analysis. So we have completed the fourth of four presentations in the series introducing you to HEC Watt. In this presentation, we showed a number of examples of where HEC Watt was used and to discuss some of the challenges and solutions to these challenges. Now would be a great time to jot down any questions that you have and bring those up during our last discussion session, which we will be holding shortly. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation on HEC Watt.